Good morning, and welcome to the Mini Storage Messenger Self Storage Webinar Series. I'm Poppy Behrens, publisher at Minico, and we're delighted to have you in the audience today. This is one of several informative webinars that we plan for self storage owners, operators, managers, investors, developers, and other industry professionals. If you're joining us for the first time today, welcome. The topic of today's webinar is five common website mistakes and how to avoid them, presented by Mario Fagali. Mario is the co-founder co and COO of Barefoot.com, a free nationwide self-storage locator site. Mario considers himself a true internet nerd, and he has grown Barefoot's uh, network from one site with a few thousand visitors to over 100 websites with more than 80,000 monthly visitors. With his extensive background in psychology, statistics, and analysis, he helps thousands of self-storage facilities generate more tenants online. Mario frequently writes about the free tools that help facility owners track their results and increase traffic to their own websites. For 32 years, the Mini Storage Messenger has been the original voice of the self-storage industry. Each edition of Messenger provides in-depth information about the latest industry trends and relevant issues. Minico also publishes a variety of other self-storage data sources, such as those you see on your screen. So if you'd like more information about any of these, please visit our website at ministoragemessenger.com. Just a quick note before we get started that today's webinar will be recorded. It will be available for viewing on demand from our archive. You may submit questions for Mario at any time throughout the webinar by simply typing your question into the question area and clicking send. We will absolutely try to answer all questions at the end of the webinar. However, those that cannot be answered due to time constraints will be answered by way of email by Mario once the webinar has conclu concluded. Today's presentation should run about 40 minutes with the remainder of the hour open to questions and answers. And now it's my distinct pleasure to turn the presentation over to Mario. Good morning, Mario. Good morning, Poppy. First, uh, I'd like to thank everyone for taking the time to join us today. I'd also like to thank Poppy and Minico for allowing us to put on this seminar. Um, so as Poppy mentioned, just a little bit about my background and what we do. So uh, just so everyone have kind of an idea before I jump into things. Um, we currently have about 5,000 facilities using our various marketing products to help uh, fill their vacant units. I'm sure many of you have either spoken with me personally or another member of our team uh, to help improve your listings on, on Spare Foot Network, for instance. And just to tell you a little bit back on our, on our philosophy, is we've always taken a completely open approach to sharing data, to sharing information uh, with our clients and with the facilities that we work with, because we honestly feel that the more value uh, we can create for you, the better we'll also do. Any improvements that we find um, are also going to help uh, the facilities on their own sites. Today, however, I'm, I'm not going to go into, I'm not going to talk about how to improve your listings or, or spare foot at all, really. Um, it's about something more important, and that's, that's your own website. Uh, over the past few years, we've spent a lot of time talking with facility owners, and not just about the various marketing products we have, but also ways that they can improve their, their performance on their own websites. Uh, for most of you, your site is the single most important part of your online presence and should be treated as such. Uh, think of it as an extension of your business with its purpose to grow your business. When I talk to owners about their websites, we don't just go over things they should do, but what's more important is that we go over the things that they, they shouldn't be doing or the, the mistakes that they've already made. And that's exactly what today's about. After talking to hundreds, if not thousands of owners, um, we basically put together a list of the five most common uh, website mistakes uh, storage operators can, owners and operators make and how to avoid them. Clearly there are more than five, but we, we only have an hour and I want to make sure this is a good use of everyone's time. I, I'm not going to be able to solve every problem in the next 40 minutes, so if you'd like more information about any of the topics I go over, or have any other questions, as Poppy mentioned, feel free to email me. My email is just mario at sparefoot.com, and I'd be, I'd be delighted to go into more detail or send you more information about specific topics. So here's the agenda for today. Uh, first, I'm, I'm going to 
go over the five most common and costly website mistakes and how to avoid them. And we'll go through each one in detail. Uh, second, I'm going to touch on uh, the, the most important one in my mind, which is a tracking and a web analytics. And then finally, I'm going to I'm going to open it up to Q A and answer any questions anyone anyone may have. So before we jump into things, I, I want to make sure um, everyone has a kind of a clear idea of <laughs> perception versus reality. And the purpose of this slide is to give you a harsh reality that just because you have a website, it doesn't mean you're done. It, it's actually really just the beginning. So I know the perception that I had, and maybe I'm alone here, but is once we built our website, you, you have this mentality, okay, I'm going to build a website, and I'm going to conquer the internet once it's built, and people are just going to start flooding to it in mass, and I'm not going to be able to control the amount of tenants or whatever I may be getting from it. And that, <laughs> what's Actually, that's not really the reality of the situation. Building a website is a ton of work, and it's really just the beginning. And driving traffic to your website is, is not easy and, and can be relatively expensive. And because you're going to be spending money on these things, uh, you want to make sure that you're constantly monitored, monitoring uh, the performance as well as making iterations as well and optimizing your entire process on your site, every page, details, things like that, basically looking at those, those things obsessively uh, in order to get the most, most of value out of it. So I, I know a lot of this stuff seems like bad news, but it, it's not. And I'm going to show you uh, how, especially at the top part um, on, on building websites to start, what do the common mistake operators do? And make sure that you all, especially the people on this webinar, have the systems in place in order to absolutely dominate. So five most common mistakes. When I think about what makes a good web website, the main thing that comes into my head is it does all the thinking for me. I, I never have to go figure anything out or dig to find more information dig to find more information. I, I know what I want to do and the site just makes it easily easy for me to do those things. The, the problem is getting to that point is actually very difficult because most owners and operators I speak with don't have the time to figure out how to build a top performing site. They want to test different promotions and content but don't have a good way to do it. And, and that leads me to my first point is that number one, it's hard to make simple updates. Creating a well a well performing site is never easy and requires a ton of constant changes. Uh, if you have the set it and forget it mentality, you're going to fail. The main issue most operators have is they don't have a simple way to make updates. They're willing to try new things, but don't have the means to do it. So first things first, you, do ha you have to have a way easy way to make changes because they're going to be happening frequently. Second thing is the unique value prop is missing. Uh, this can be defined also as, a, as what makes you stand out. When someone is searching on the internet for storage, they don't usually just go to one site. They go to multiple. And if you can't quickly illustrate the one or two things that make you different, uh, you're going to be forgotten about by the consumer, and they're going to move on. Uh, it, you, you may, it might be best value. It might be great location. It might be highest or superior security. Whatever it is that makes you stand out, you want to make sure that this message is clear. Uh, number three, it doesn't answer questions. Um, how many times do you get a phone call from someone who asks you a question that is already answered on your website? Or they, they ask it multiple, multiple times. You hear the same thing over and over again. Uh, we used to get this over, all the time. People would ask us for office hours, access hours, um, prices, features, amenities, things like that. So what we decided to do is track the number of times that someone asked the same question, the same, the same question got asked, and then just start displaying that information on the site after it crossed a certain threshold. This helps us focus on the real questions that consumers really want to ask, and it helped increase the number of uh, consumers that actually made reservations online and over the phone. Number four um, is visitors don't convert into customers. This is clearly a big problem, because you should be obsessed with looking at the, at the number of people who visit your site and the number that turn into tenants. The only real levers uh, knobs you have to increase your website's performance is either get more people to your website 
or figure out a way to increase the current number of people visiting your website into tenants. In other words, the percentage of people that actually turn into paying customers. And then moving along to number five, a, a lot of companies have poor performance tracking and they can't measure those type of metrics that are required for number four. Um, are people actually, and you have to have the systems in place to, uh, to measure what actions visitors are actually taking on your website. Are they making reservations? Are they calling? Are they clicking around? How long are they staying on your site? And, and much more. There are many different ways to get people to come to your website and there's a lot of companies out there that specialize in getting traffic for you. Um, we can talk about those things offline later, but if you can effectively measure what marketing channels are working for you and giving you results, no matter what initiatives you're taking, SEO, SEM, putting ads on classified, using aggregators, you're going to be saving a ton of money by cutting the unprofitable channels and make more money by dedicating more resources to the ones that work. Um, and it's also, if you have the tracking place, it's going to eliminate any guesswork you have to make on whether or not you should continue to be using a specific service or if a service is working well for you. So we'll focus on uh, web analytics tools at the end, and I'll talk about a little bit of call tracking uh, later on. So those are the most common web website mistakes we see, and now we're going to just dive a step deeper into each one, and I'll show you an example of how each can occur and ways to avoid making them in the future. So as I mentioned before, you're going to make mistakes and you want to make changes and you're going to want to make changes on your website. If you don't have a simple way to do so, it's going to put you at a huge disadvantage relative to a competitor who can. So let's say you want to offer a new promotion, but right now in order to change anything on your site, you have to contact your web guy, wait for them to respond to you, agree on how long it's going to take, figure out how much it's going to cost, when it's going to be implemented, and then the time that you just, by, the, by the time you figure out what that's going to be, it's a week later and you've probably already forgot what the offer is going to be. And if you want to try more and continue this process, it's going to take forever. Um, the, the online world moves quickly and you need to have the systems in place that allow you to make changes as fast as you can think of them. Uh, you shouldn't have to call someone every time you want to make an update and you shouldn't have to spend more than 10 minutes to add a special promotion. And since things change, since you change, things change so fast and so rapidly, um, you're probably going to mess things up and want to switch them around. So the main solution to this is you shouldn't, and also you shouldn't have to be changing any lines of code in order to do this, you should have a content management system. And uh, it's also known as a CMS. And that's exactly what this problem solves. So a content management system is a place where you can basically log into and change any information on your site. Um, Whisper, for example, if you log into your account that we have for you, you can change anything you'd like and um, it automatically gets updated in the proper format that it needs to be so it's reflected on the website accordingly. Uh, and, th and that's basically what a CMS is. It takes, the, it takes all the coding out for you. It basically has blocks that you can make the edits into and then it stamps them on your site in the correct design. So the other thing with CMS is anyone can update it. Um, it's just that it's as easy to make as if you're putting a Facebook post or um, updating a LinkedIn profile or anything like that. It's just point, click, and type. You, your facility manager, janitor, teenage kid can be able to make changes. Uh, it's quick and easy to update a site with a CMS. Imagine adding a new page that has uh, pictures and things like that. If you have no CMS, you, uh, you're going to have to update the links on every page. And if you do update the links on every single page, probably create new pages, things like that. And if you have a CMS, it should be just as easy as dragging and dropping a photo into the place you need to. Um, everything also looks better with a content management system. Everything has its place. You designs usually come out sleeker and cleaner and simpler, and you don't and it does you don't have to pay a developer to make any of these things. You just have to pay them the initial upfront to build this thing out for you, so you can make changes. Um, so you'll want the person running your site to provide you with a, one of these so you can make changes easily. If you're bid building your site from scratch, you might want to think about building it uh, in, in WordPress or other similar sites that provide the basic template. And once you have one of these, it'll, it, it makes making changes just insanely easy. So the next thing I will go over is the unique value prop. So what is a unique value? selling proposition. If you have someone look at your site for less than two seconds, 
what message would you want to stick in their heads? If, if you know what this message is, do you know where it's located on your site? Is it up and center so someone on the visiting can't miss it? Uh, is it on the page right before someone makes a reservation? Is it hidden within some text or worse, nowhere to be found at all? In most cases that I've seen, I can't really find them. Usually some of the larger players have something that stands out. So in order to compete, you want to make sure that anyone visiting your site uh, also remembers the main message you want to get across. And it's not always the same. Like some examples would be uh, first month free. Uh, it's, it's a popular offer that I see. Market's probably getting saturated with this kind of message, but it might be uh, any type of promotion that gets someone in the door instantly. Uh, it might be superior security. Uh, this is always a concern, especially for high-end customers, for instance. Uh, things like showing your cameras, uh, showing a record of no break-ins, fences, anything like that. Perfect location, I admit it. No matter, no matter how well you advertise, it's still about location. And make it easy for them to see where your location is. Use Google Maps, for instance, or pictures of your facility from a street-level view, anything like that. So I'll use you store as an example, because almost anywhere I look on their site, they have the low price guarantee. So no matter no matter what, I'm comfortable knowing that I'm getting a good uh, getting a good deal by booking on their website. I don't I don't really have to search that many more because they claim they'll beat anyone. It at least gives me some sense of security that I'm getting a good rate. Uh, this offer is right on their homepage and in many other spots on their site as well. So I challenge you to look at your website and see if you can find yours and then look at your competitors and see if you can find theirs. And in order to differentiate yourself, you'll need to figure out what your unique value prop is and make sure visitors see that message when they go to your site. So let's move on. The third biggest mistake we noticed is that the website websites just don't answer the consumer's questions. Think about the number of times, as I mentioned before, you've received calls from potential customers that ask the same exact thing. What's even more frustrating is when they ask you information that's already on your website and no one can see it. See it. I've, I've even heard companies tell me that they leave out information intentionally so that customers will be more likely to call them and then they can close those deals. The, the, the problem with that logic is that most customers who don't see what they need will usually just move on. So the, the facilities are actually really just shooting themselves in the foot by missing out on the larger segment who want to move forward but simply can't because there's not enough information. So here's a common, here's some common things that, that we've heard. Um, where are you located? How much does it cost? What hours are you open? How do I make a reservation? Is my stuff going to be safe? Um, most of these are easy to answer, but it also helps if you highlight your unique features about your facility as well. Best value, 24-hour access, or manager on site, call or make a reservation, or, or highlight the security features. If you showed your security system on your site, it'd answer the question, for instance, would my stuff be safe? Uh, don't give any room for the customer to go away from your site because it doesn't answer the question that they have and they can't get to a phone because they're at work, for instance, or not in the ideal place to make a call. I actually think a good example of this is uh, Morningstar, if you know them. Um, Morningstar makes it actually very easy for the consumer to figure out what they need. It answers all the major questions like how much, where, transportation, um, what's the service like? And this is all up in front of, up, up in, in the top navigation, and it's on every single page. And as you dig deeper into your, their site, for instance, you learn about the office hours and access hours, security features, and the other basic amenities, and basically any other basic amenity that you could imagine. So again, this is an example of how a company does it, and I challenge you to look at some other websites that are out there and see how they do it as a prime example. Uh, the last thing you want to do is, is make the customer ask a question they can't find the answer to. Make your site brain dead to navigate through, and people who start visiting your site are going to start turning into customers. And this brings me to my next biggest mistake. 
is that visitors don't convert into revenue. You can pour tons of money into a website, contractors, an agency, et cetera, but what, what, is, what, what good is any of it if, it's not, if they're not converting um, if they're not converting traffic into customers. And there's no real quick fix to this problem. It, it, it's, it's an ongoing process that requires a ton of work, but will page, pay huge rewards going forward. Having a website is great, but you do not want to dump all that money in to get, to, you don't want to dump all that money into development costs just to have something that either looks pretty, but no one converts, or gets no visitors, um, or worse, gets visitors that don't convert into tenants. People actually need to see the pages that you create uh, and have a chance to interact and, more importantly, transact online. The problem that most people have is they think that if they, uh, once they get their website up, the, the work is done. And this just can't be further than from the truth. I just want to reiterate on that point. It takes a lot of work to see results from your website. Uh, but, and, and to be successful online, it requires a ton of attention. So what's the solution to this? So you want to make sure your website is set up so you can optimize for conversions. In other words, your site is made so you can make adjustments on the number of people visiting your site and the number that turn into rentals. To do this, you'll need to create the opportunity for, a, for an action to occur or a transaction to take place. The two main ways that this can happen online is one, a visitor can fill out a form and make a reservation, or two, a visitor uh, can make a call and call a number that's on your site and have the chance to transact it over the phone. Make sure both of these mechanisms are in place so you at least have a chance to make money off someone who visits your website. Um, you'll also want to make sure that if someone has to fill out a form, the form is clean and really simple to fill out. For example, you don't want to make it 100 fields asking for ridiculous information like what's your, what's your grandmother's maiden name or the emergency contact address. Think about the things that you actually need to follow up with someone. Um, and it's usually not any of that information, yet half the sites I go to require, have like 80 forms, have 80, 80 parts to fill out, and none of it really has to do with any of the information they actually need. Um, they're, in many cases, they're not actually doing the rental online. They're just submitting a contact inquiry. So think of the things that you need to follow up with a customer, usually a name, an email address, and a phone number. I mean, that's, that's really it. If you can't reach them by phone, you can shoot them an email, and you want to be able to address them properly. I mean, I would even suggest you have first name and last name. Try removing last name. I mean, you can probably get more people to fill out the form. And remember that the, the less that you require the customer to do, the more likely they're actually going to do it. So I've, I've also heard the stat that for every extra Every extra part, part you want to you want them to fill out, so every extra field creates a seven percent likelihood that they're not going to fill it out. So seven percent less likely that they're actually going to go forward with it. So also be sure to not put anything. Don't put anything your, on your website that makes them go away from your site. So if you want that, if if you want um, if you want them to make a transaction online, for instance don't have links that go all over the place, especially to other websites where they may not come back. An example of this is a lot of management software companies uh, we work with and, and they're great partners, things like that, um, they'll do things like make you, they'll, they'll have a form that, that goes away from the site. And it's really nice that they offer these tools, but think about it from, from the consumer. They, they want to have a consistent process and if they have to go to another site to go fill out a form, other than maintaining it on your own, for instance, that's an additional layer of friction that is just unnecessary. So make sure the flow, and, and it's going to cause a breakage in your conversion funnel, because the person who's actually clicking and going to the next step 
doesn't feel it like, might not think that they're on the right page, for instance, doesn't know what page they're on. They were looking at a storage website and they got shot over to this other one. They, they just, it, it just creates confusion that, and you don't want them to think. The moment that they go, what's going on, is the moment that you just missed that transaction. So again, if you make it brain dead simple and brainless to navigate through, it's going to make it a lot more, more likely that they're going to transact with, a, transact with your site and do that next action that you desire. So the other thing is that if you're investing in your website, you want to spend some time understanding how Google works. They're, they're basically the go-to site for anyone searching for any information online, storage included, and they're going to be more than likely your main source of traffic. In other words, consumers that, people actually visiting your site. And the three ways, the three main ways that they're going to bring traffic to your site are through your free local business listing. And if you don't have this claim, you should claim it already. It's really simple. Just go to google.com slash LBC and you can go and claim your business listing and that's going to come up on the, on the map results and also um, transition to mobile. Uh, those are kind of the main things that are coming up in mobile search as well. The other one is uh, search SEO. So a lot of people refer to search engine optimization. Uh, that's basically when in the, in the organic results, the natural search results that come up in Google, uh, that's where a lot of the traffic will come from as well. And uh, search engine marketing. So this is for Google, for instance, this is their pay-per-click advertising program. So this is where you actually pay uh, per every time that someone actually visits, uh, someone clicks on a link and visits your website. And a lot of companies I know are spending a ton of money on this, but don't have a good understanding of how it works or what's going on. And um, I have multiple conversations with owners who just are just asking me in-depth questions about this type of stuff, or actually really general questions. And if they educate themselves more on it to begin with, then they'll know the proper questions to ask any firm that they work with, or if they're trying to do it in-house or on their own. That way they don't waste a ton of money going to the wrong companies and trying to outgame the system, which everyone working at Google is pretty smart, so trying to do that is not going to give you any long-term results in my opinion. They're the ones sending you visitors, so it's wise to just invest the time to educate yourself and learning how they work and what they do. Finally, um, always be testing. You, you never know what works better if you don't try new things. I, I recommend coming up with a new promotion every couple months and trying it out to see what kind of results you get. I mean, we're, for us, for instance, we're constantly testing new things over here to see what consumers actually respond to. And it's simple things, like what if we make the photo larger instead of the small photo? What if it's a large photo in the left-hand corner instead of the right-hand corner? Does it make it more likely that people are going to fill out a form? What about different button colors? Uh, we'll work with companies, and they'll, they'll be testing different promotions on our time, and we both are getting real-time feedback on it half of two months off instead of one month free. Just what, is the, what are the wording changes that you need to make that are going to cause more people to transact online? And if you're constantly iterating that, um, you're going to make – and all these differences – you might not get a huge difference to begin with, but you might get a lot of small little incremental improvements that just add up over time. And this is what will give you a huge advantage. And this is what some of the large companies do at scale can do at mass scale. And those little tiny differences add up. And you want to make sure that you're constantly figuring out not just what's working, but also what's not working. Having Putting a promotion up there that just fails miserably is a great thing to know. Because then you can say with confidence, I tried this and it didn't work. And I'll get to my next point, which is tracking, so you can actually figure out how to do this next. But before I go on to it, I want to show you a good example of a company that actually does this uh, pretty well. So to achieve conversion optimization, there should be a clear way for people, for consumers to become customer, customers, uh, a short and to the point conversion path. Um, Manhattan Mini Storage, for instance, starts collecting information before the visitor even sees the facility. Uh, they also have, so I mean, if you look at this, they're figuring out what zip code they're in, 
when they're going to move in, how long they're going to stay, um, and how often they're going to be accessing their stuff before they even they're, they're getting some information up front before the customer even goes forward with anything. I'm not saying I recommend this for everyone, but I'm saying just notice how they just ask for information, and consumers are going to give it to them too. They have little check marks which on the right hand side, so the, so the consumer knows when it's properly filled out and if it's not properly filled out. Even more so, uh, they have a number everywhere. So every page they have, they have that giant 1-800 number. So consumers, if they decide not to make a reservation online, for instance, they'll also have, they, they have a way to call the facility immediately. And I guarantee they're constantly changing and testing new promotions uh, in order to see how, if they can get more people who are visiting their site to current turn it to tenants. As I mentioned before, you might already have a website. You may not. Regardless, you want to be able to track all your online activity. If, if you track what your customers are doing, you can start measuring your marketing efforts, for instance. And this is especially important if you're going to be spending money to get people to your website because you'll want to know if they're turning into tenants. To do this, you'll need the systems in place to measure how customers engage with your site. So here are some basic metrics uh, that you should be measuring, and that's how many of your how many people are visitors or visits or unique visitors are coming to your website a day. Um, how what pages are they going to? How long are they staying on your site? Are they filling out in any of the information on your forms? If not, why not? Are any people getting to the page where they can actually fill out a form? Um, is that form, does it have too much information? And if it does, what if I minimize it? If I require less information, then how well are people converting? How many people are the people who visit your site actually call you directly? And in order to do this, uh, we'll go into more detail, but you'll need a tracked phone number. And if you're collecting money, for instance, if you're charging the customer, um, how much money, how much revenue you're collecting online? So those are some basic metrics. And the solution is start tracking and get tracking and start getting reports on this stuff regularly. And when you start to think about tracking, you have to look at what your consumers are doing. When they're going to your site, where are they clicking? How are they navigating? How soon are they leaving, et cetera? You must look at all these metrics to start to understand your customer's behavior. Once you can do this, you'll need to look at the areas where there are clear weaknesses, like the number of people calling my website is low. Then ask the question, okay, how can I improve that? Look at things like making the number bigger or moving it to the top right-hand corner instead of the bottom left. And there's uh, programs like uh, Callfire, just like callfire.com, for instance, actually generate numbers for you that are local numbers that you can forward to your facility, you put these numbers anywhere, and they'll help you track the basic phone metrics. And this is, for instance, how many people actually called that number, did someone pick up, how long did someone stay on, things like that. You can go back and listen to the calls later as well. But this will help you because if you actually have the metric, if you have a web analytics system in place, which I'll go over next, you can see how many people are visiting your site, and if you have a call tracking system in place, you can figure out of those people who visited my site, how many of them actually called. And then you can do the tweaks that I mentioned before. And when you're looking at the number of people who visited your site and clicked around, you'll need a tracking system. Um, one I recommend is, is Google Analytics. It's free. Um, it's, it's super powerful and it's really easy to use. It's, it's actually just like cut and paste ready code and I'll talk about that in a little more detail about a minute here. Uh, and the other thing you'll have to do before you spend a dollar on marketing is figure out how much your typical customer is worth. So you're going to be spending money to attract visitors to your site, so you must have an idea of how much you're willing to pay in order to get them. Um, because you're not going to be able to control someone coming online, for instance, someone walks to your door, you can't tell them to get into the largest unit and stay for eight years, but if you know your averages, you can at least figure out, well, okay, well, how much is my typical customer worth to me, and that's how much I'm willing to spend to acquire one. And it, it, it's, 
an easy way to do this is to ask yourself, okay, well, what's the typical size someone rents from me? Let's say it's a 10 by 10. Um, how long does it usually go for? I'm bad at math, so I'm just going to make this easy, 10 months. And, or, well, how much does it go for? 100 bucks, and how long does it stay? 10 months, and that's, you can say, okay, well, that's $1,000 per person that walks in the, more, walks in the door. They're worth $1,000. They bring $1,000 revenue to me. Um, when you do the math, you'll have a number, like 1,000, then you can decide how much you're willing to spend depending on your area. So if it's 1,000 and depending on your margins, things like that, then you say, well, okay, well, I'm willing to spend $100 or $50 or $2, whatever it may be. Uh, once you have the systems in place, to measure how well your site is converting, you can then do the math on how much how much does it make sense for me to spend on a marketing channel per move-in um, to acquire the customer. Example, if you're paying $3 a click, for instance, and you're getting 100 clicks per reservation, you're spending $300 to get a customer in the door. If your average lifetime value is 100 bucks, this may or may not make sense to you depending on how, depending on your area. But that's how you can basically justify the cost and figure out what's working for you and what's not. So um, I'm going to go into just a little bit more about analytics. Some of the things that way to, you can download this program actually really, really quickly. Uh, it's just google.com slash analytics, and you can be measuring anything you can, anything you can think of pretty quickly. And like the things I mentioned, the number of people visiting, how long they're staying, uh, number of pages they're actually seeing on the site, um, bounce rates, which is basically how many people see one page and then leave immediately. You can also filter by traffic source, so you can figure out where the customers are actually coming from. And you can also set specific goals as well. So if you have a funnel of, okay, I need someone to go from step my home page, pick a unit, then make a reservation, you can track the entire process and see how well it's converting. And I'll go. Um, I'll, I'll show you an example of that next. So here's a quick little dashboard of what Google Analytics looks like. Um, you can compare month over month, month trend data. See when you do make make annotations actually on the date that, for instance, you made a change. Like, okay, I made the photos bigger. Now, did that make more? Did that cause my average time on the site to go up? You can look at your average time to site metric and say, okay, well, when I made my change a month ago, now 17% are staying longer, and I didn't really get any more visitors, so yeah, that did make that did make an impact. Again, as I mentioned before, you can break it down by traffic source too. So this is just looking at Google Organic, Yahoo Organic, and you can also create links for any other type of source that you have and attribute it that way as well. So in here, you can actually create links for let's say you're posting an ad on Craigslist, and label them the same way you want to see them in here. And that way, anyone who clicks from a specific ad, you can track the number uh, that came and exactly what actions they engage with on your site. So again, I mentioned what's the goal. Um, if your goal is to get someone to book a unit, for instance, then you might have a, you might have a home page. I call them mariastorage.com. And then the next step would be for them to click a unit size and then fill out a form, and then finally, if they do do that, they get to a thank you page. So this is Mario Storage, and then it's slash 10 by 10 would be the next page, um, which would just be any unit size, and then the next step would be to get to the thank you page, and the number of people who got to the thank you page would be the number of people who fill out a form. So I'd be tracking how many people go to the first step, click on the unit size, then fill out a form. And here's an example of a, just a conversion funnel. So, I mean, you're going to be hearing a ton about how you can get drive traffic to your to your own site, things like that, from different sources. But you want to know how well it's actually converting for you, no matter what source it's coming from. So you have to check on, okay, how many people actually click on my homepage, for instance, uh, pick a unit size, and then confirm. And you can set this all up in Google Analytics. So let's say you spend three dollars um, per click, and you got 500 visits. You got to spend fifteen hundred dollars. You got ten rentals out of it. So, and if each person was worth thousand dollars to you, you're paying one hundred and fifty bucks per customer. If half move in, you're spending three hundred per customer. If they if they just decide for some reason they didn't want to move in, and then you can figure out, okay, well, does this make sense? How can I get my three dollars to two dollars 
or if I'm spending five dollars, then how much that is for me. And then you're getting really smart about tracking it. So I know we covered a lot today, but uh, just to recap, we went over the just five most common website mistakes and how to solve them. So making it's hard to make uh, simple updates. You need value props missing doesn't answer questions. Visitors don't convert into customers and poor tracking performance. So I uh, appreciate you taking the time to listen to me today, and I hope that this this was informative. Um, I'm going to now open it up to to QA. Um, also mentioned that we're doing a 30-day free trial of one of our new products out there that help help actually visitors uh, convert into tenants through a uh, Google. Google listings, Google Places listings specifically. Um, also, if you don't, if you don't want to ask a question now, you can um, email me just at mariotreffa.com. There's my phone number, and uh, that's all I have in mind. All right, we've got a lot of questions that came in. First one is about mistake number three. One question people ask over and over is prices. In your opinion, should we list them online? So I, th I think that's a great question. Um, this, this goes back to this goes back to the um, topic I talked about beforehand, which is some people will leave off. I've heard companies say they leave off prices in order just so they can sell them on the phone, and I would just honestly try it and see if it works because no one's going to go back to you uh, two months later and tell you, well, you had your prices online, then you took them off. What's the deal? I mean, uh, it's a temporal market for storages at least, and no one no one really goes and visits multiple times. Um, my, I honestly think you should have your should have your prices online, and see if it, I would have a system in place to measure the number of phone calls you're getting, put your prices online, and see if that has any effect on it. We haven't seen any, um, and you might be able to actually convert people better because they're think about it. The consumer is actually going unless you have the prime prime real estate. The consumer is going to go check it out, want to do price shopping online. That's some segment of it look at one site, say, oh, this doesn't have any information. I'm at work. I can't call right now. Okay, I'll go to the next one and move forward. So I would say try it. Put the systems in place to measure if it has any effect and let me know what the results are. Next question. What are the benchmarks in the self-storage industry for visitors per day and average time on site? Oh, um, that's a great question. I actually, I, I each site is each site is so different. I mean, it, it's so unique that I, I wouldn't, I, I'd be, I'd be happy to share some of the stuff that, that we know, but I, I, I don't, I, I couldn't, but I, I do that offline. Um, and feel free to email me that question. But uh, in terms of metrics overall for the industry, uh, that, that's, that's, that's arbitrary. It kind of just depends on the facility. I, I think you got to think of it more like, what are the metrics that I need for my site to be, for my site to be functioning the way I want it to, and be performing the way I want to, and then have those as your benchmark and and drive results to that. So that's my top out answer for that. Okay. Next question: What are the common ratios for traffic sources, such as search engines, direct traffic, and referring sites? It it really depends on how much you're dedicating. Um, how much you're dedicating. Typically, if if a site is like ranking number one and they're Maxing out on PPC, for instance, they can get a, they can get up to like 50-50 uh, pay-per-click versus uh, versus SEO, and that's that's something we've seen some like large companies get to. Uh, but I, again, it really depends on how much you're allocating. It, it, it's it's a question of you can control the, the levers that you can switch are if you improve your SEO, then it's going to be obviously a higher ratio. If you're driving, if you if you're on 30 directories, then your ratio is going to be a lot higher from the directories. So. It, it just depends on where you're allocating your resources. But in terms of if, if companies are maxed out on SEO, PPC, that can drive at least, it can be a 50-50 breakdown. Okay, next question. I understand that we want a bounce rate of 0%, but what do you consider a good bounce rate? I'd say anything under, anything under 30% is pretty solid. Um, for storage, yeah, for storage, I see some companies that are, are higher than that. I would say that they're just not communicating their message properly because storage isn't something that, that consumers look at for fun. I, I, I can't, with the exception of me, um, I, I, don't, I don't know very many storage consumers who shop for storage the same way they do for houses or cars or things like that. It's not really, I browse around thinking about looking and, and enjoy it. So I, I would say if you'd get that down to about 30%, I, that's pretty good. All right.
right, next question. For WordPress, do you recommend SEO plugins or hiring an organization to do this? So that's, uh, that's, that's a good question, too. Um, if you ever ask that question, they can shoot me an email. And, and if you do go with an organization, I have kind of a standard template of questions that I, I suggest that you ask before you go with any agency just to make sure that they're doing the right things and, and not just trying to take money. Um, not to say that all companies do that, just to say that I want to, I, I have a template of, of questions that you should ask. Uh, I, I'd say you can definitely try it. Uh, you can definitely try it on your own if you educate yourself on it. Uh, but it, if, if you don't have the time or resources, then you're going to want to probably hire, bring someone, bring someone on either in-house best in my opinion, but if you got to bring on a firm, then that's fine too. All right, next question uh, is, can you explain what a bounce rate is? Yeah, sure. So a bounce rate is basically if let's say let's say this is kind of an abbreviated version of it, but let's say ten people go and visit your site and a person goes to your goes to your website and of those ten people, um, five of them click on a button or stay on your site for you know a, a certain period of time. A bounce is basically considered if let's say five of those people go to your site and then immediately hit back. So they don't go, they don't do anything else on that page. They go see one page and then they hit back and that's considered a bounce. Uh, usually, it usually indicates um, that the consumer didn't get the information that they were looking for. So if you had five people who went to the next page and five people who left after immediately seeing the first page, you'd have a 50% bounce rate. All right. Another question about uh, pricing online. How would you recommend posting pricing online? If the price is the deciding factor, wouldn't someone shopping around stick with the site of the lowest price? Uh, that, that depends. I, I think that uh, uh, there's different consumers want different things, and people shop differently. Um, I, I, I tell the story about about my mom every time someone um, tells me that is. I remember she was looking at on Hotels.com one day for a hotel, and she typed in the area, and I was watching her do this, and she typed in the area and then immediately looked past the cheapest one and went like to the second and third one. I said, well, why didn't you just go for the cheapest one? She said, because it's the cheapest one. So, and, and I was just really confused. I was kind of in awe by that because her her buying cycle was is different than Mine, for instance, the way she purchases things is different than mine. She doesn't always go with the cheapest option. In fact, she actually intentionally choose, doesn't choose the cheapest option. So, I would say I would say putting just because one segment price shops doesn't mean that another does, and you, you kind of have to have an understanding of what type of what type of consumer do you want. And if if you're only competing on price, then I, I would try to put some other value propositions on the site too. All right, another question actually by the same person. If our website looks great and we've done everything to ensure that it gives all the content the user needs, wouldn't they be inclined to call for pricing? If the, if the website, let me make sure I understand. If the, if the website looks great um, and, well, maybe, maybe not. I, I mean, I, I have difficulty answer, answering that question because I, I, I think it really depends on, uh, a consumer is not just one person. It's, it's multiple, multiple segments of people who have their own decision making. They have their own decision making processes. And just because you're going to have a subset of consumers, again, the question that I would want to ask is, how can I get the most, the most out of my site? If you don't have, if you don't have your prices online and it's generating more calls and you're closing more of them, then fantastic. I'm not going to tell you to change anything. If you if you if someone told me that they tried putting prices online and it generated less calls and they got less tenants out of it, then I would then if then when they didn't, I'd say don't do it. Always do what gets more tenants for you. But if you haven't tried that already, that's something that then I would say that the site isn't doing everything that it possibly can do because there is something left to try. All right. I think that uh, just about covers the questions that we have so far. Again, if you have any additional questions, please go ahead and send them over now. And uh, Mario will be more than happy to answer them for you one-on-one. -on -one. We'd like to thank everyone for attending today's webinar. We certainly hope we've provided you with some useful information. 
you will be receiving an email with a link to the archived presentation along with a special offer, so make sure you watch your inbox for this. And uh, for those of you who are interested, our next webinar is scheduled for June 22nd, presented by self-storage marketing expert Derek Naylor. The topic will be tools for marketing online by way of social media. To sign up for this or any of our other upcoming webinars, please visit our website at ministoragemessenger.com. Again, we'd like to thank everyone for attending today, and we hope you have a wonderful rest of the day.